Hello, everyone. Uh, this is the C calls for lifecycle intro. Uh, I'm Vincent Pricanano. I work at Red Hat, um, and I'm co-chair for the SIG. And I'm Cecil Robert Michon, and I work at Microsoft. I'm one of the tech leads for Cluster Lifecycle, and I'm also a maintainer of the Cluster API in CAPZ. Awesome. So what exactly do we do here? Uh, the SIG is pretty large. It's one of the largest SIGs. We have a lot of sub-projects. We'll get more into stats later. But the objective is to simplify creation, configuration, upgrade, downgrade, and tear down of Kubernetes clusters and their components. Kind of a mouthful. Has a lot of scope. So we do a lot of things like Cluster API, KubeADM. What did KubeADM do in, in the uh, early stages? It allowed you to create a cluster, a node, bootstrap it, configure it, then Cluster API on top of it. It allowed you to create fleet of clusters. So what are we building? The vision is to build a meta cloud. And that's a kind of a bold vision for the SIG. We have a lot of tools in the SIG that, and Cluster API is one of that, that allows you to, to declare these APIs. And we went to production ready in 2016. And we're now talking also like to have like the first V1 release of these APIs. We have extensive test coverage. A lot of our projects are actually also Kubernetes release informing and also blocking soon, eventually. Our motto, like how kind of like we build everything with the 80% use case in mind and making the 20% possible. Really what that means is we go out, we try to ask like people that use Kubernetes, that run fleet of clusters, what is it to run these fleet of clusters? Like what are the big issues? But also like we don't wanna paint ourselves in a corner to, to build niche things that like only a few will build, but we want to make everything extensible. And that's the clear, well-defined docking ports. You can just imagine like you have a spaceship, that's your product, you have this other spaceship that is Cluster API or KubeADM, you want to dock them together. You want to like make sure that they can work in tandem. So that's kind of like our philosophy on how we approach our, um, everything in our community. In numbers, we have a lot of contributors, more than 2,600, over 70 companies like all over the globe like um, contribute. Um, you can see like we have 24 sub-projects in the SIG and more than 3,000 PRs. Um, and this is just for the last year. Uh, if you look back, like we had like in the V1 Alpha 1 days, uh, these numbers were actually even higher. Um, but now the project's getting more mature every day. This is kind of the stack. It's a kind of, it's a very simplified view on like, you know, what gets you to a Kubernetes cluster. What does the SIG offer to get you to um, a Kubernetes cluster or fleet of clusters? Um, the very basic foundation, we have Kubedium, this uh, cute logo, and then the provisioner on top of it. There's COPS, Cluster API, as we, as we mentioned, and CAPI. Cluster API has also a lot of providers underneath. Um, we have providers for AWS, Azure, GCP, and also some bare metals provider. Once you create a Kubernetes cluster, what does the first thing that you gotta install? CNI, otherwise your cluster does not get ready. And then after that it's like, oh, I need to install my cloud controller manager, and then I have to install like other things to make this cluster actually useful. So we allow to do you all of that. Um, project like Cluster API, like they do have like a provider like Helm, there's also the Cluster Add-ons project. But let's take Helm for a second. When you wanna create a cluster, you wanna configure that, that whole cluster, maybe in your Git repo or in, a, in another Kubernetes cluster and create other clusters from that to create functioning cluster that then you probably wanna give out to other teams. Um, and those clusters, they have to come with those add-ons. But then what happens? Monitoring, node fails, they have to be replaced. Cluster API has introduced like a few years ago uh, what we call KCP, as in Kubernetes control plane, and it's a full managed solution to run control planes. It will check at CD, make sure that you can do things that will, sh you know, you can shoot yourself in the foot for a lot of things. Um, and it will make sure that like every upgrade is safe. Like, 
Can I upgrade, do I have to upgrade core DNS? Can I upgrade to this version of core DNS when I'm running my upgrade? Those are the things that we built in, this great community built in to make sure that you can run your clusters as safe as possible, but not just run it and just forget about it. Also like make sure that the upgrade process will work great. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about something a bit different, which is something that we did recently. Uh, we did a self-assessment survey inside the SIG. So like Vince was mentioning, we have 24 sub-projects in the SIG, which is huge, and I think it's very uh, rare in Kubernetes SIGs. Most SIGs have a vertical area that they own, like SIG network or uh, SIG API machinery. Uh, SIG cluster lifecycle is a bit different in that it's a collection of projects that work together and are modular that you can kind of pick and choose which ones you want to use, and in the end, you build a solution. So one thing with that is that when we do the annual uh, SIG survey, self-assessment, that some of you might be familiar with at the SIG level, we end up answering a lot of it depends because it depends on the projects. Um, some projects do some processes in some ways. Some have, each one has kind of their own processes. So that doesn't give us a lot of visibility uh, as uh, SIG chairs and tech leads into what's going on into each individual project. So one thing we did in the past and we decided to do again this year is to do a survey to learn a bit more about what each project is doing and what their challenges are. And I'm gonna go over some of the results here um, and hopefully that can be helpful. Um, especially if you're looking to contribute, um, I'll be highlighting some areas. Um, okay, so the first thing we learned is one, we should do this more often. Um, so the main reason, there are two reasons for that. First of all, it was incredibly insightful for us uh, to know what is going on with the projects, as I said, learn more about their pain points, learn where we can collaborate more together. And then the second thing is actually, I think the projects actually found it useful themselves. Um, I actually sat into a few of the office hours where the projects were going through the survey and discussing the answers as a group and coming up with uh, answers. And it felt very much like a retrospective where you know it's like, oh, are we updating our owners frequently? Are we, do we have uh, a roadmap? Do we have good documentation? And it was a good way to kind of do, uh, take a pause, take a step back and kind of evaluate where we're at for each project. Um, so that was the first thing. The second thing, which I think is really good that I really wanted to highlight is how diverse the projects are uh, in terms of contributors, and that's something I'm very proud of. Um, they're, uh, I think, you know, 95% of the projects that they have contributors from multiple companies, which is a good thing. That's something we want to see for project health. Uh, it makes the project more sustainable. Um, and then we also have a lot of end users that are contributing to some of these projects, uh, which is also great to see, and we would like to have more. So, you know, end users are always welcome, um, and I think having their perspective is great because they um, bring their own use cases to the table, and then we're able to define project direction, direction together. The next thing we learned, uh, which was kind of shocking to me, is uh, we don't really have roadmaps. Um, so at first, we looked at this question, and the question was, have you reviewed or updated your project roadmap in the last six months? And we saw only 27% said yes. So then we were like, oh, well, maybe they didn't need to update the roadmap. Maybe it was already up to date. But then you can see all the extra responses. They're like, well, we don't have a roadmap. Um, <laughs> so I think that's a very common theme across Kubernetes projects. And um, this is not some meant to shame any project in particular. I think it's just something that uh, highlights that we have to work together as a SIG to define visions, not just for the SIG, but also for the projects themselves. Like, what is the vision? What is the three-year plan? What are, what are we building here? Um, and I think that, um, you know, there are many ways to have a roadmap. You don't need always to have an official roadmap document. Um, but sometimes it can be as simple as using GitHub milestones to plan your next two releases, right? Uh, anything that gives new contributors a sense of where you're driving so they can help in the right direction and then see if maybe there's something else they want to bring to the table that's not being looked at currently um, is something that we want to help projects achieve. So I think this doesn't just apply to the cluster lifecycle, but um, beyond other things as well. 
Okay, and the next thing I want to talk about is I want to highlight all the things that the projects that they worked on recently, um, so some of them, um, there's a lot, so I couldn't fit everything in the slide, but some of these are the key uh, accomplishments of some of the projects recently, so I'm gonna go through some of them. Um, so the first thing is we have now predictable automated releases in Cluster API and several of its providers. I think this is a really great accomplishment that we've been working on for the past, I would say, year and a half with the introduction of the Cluster API release team. And that not only allowed to make the releases more predictable for users consuming them and providers consuming them, but it also helped new contributors get uh, more involvement in the community, be able to spread the load on some of this chore release work, and allowed these people to take on more responsibilities in a way that is um, recognized and official. Um, so I think that was really great. Uh, the next thing is we now have the Cluster API Helm add-on provider, which Vince mentioned earlier. So that's a new project that was introduced in Cluster API to allow uh, you know, uh, automating the installation of add-ons in a declarative way. So things like CNI, Cloud Provider, uh, CSI drivers, and that is now ready to use. There's an alpha release, so if you're interested, please check it out and give some feedback. Uh, the next one is another Cluster API project, Cluster API Operator. So that one is not new, it's been around for a bit, uh, but I think there's been a lot of momentum on it lately, and it has, um, uh, I think, a really good um, uh, goal, which is to help uh, manage and install the uh, Cluster API providers. So that's really management of the providers themselves, not the workload clusters, in a declarative way. Same thing as how you manage your clusters. Um, so again, here the call to action is check it out, try it out, um, especially if you have a different infrastructure provider that hasn't been tested or documented yet, I think they would really appreciate um, your help. Um, moving on, the next one is Cluster API Managed Clusters Working Group. Um, so this one, um, a lot of different providers came together who had previously been working on a solution, uh, each in their own infrastructure provider on supporting managed Kubernetes. So uh, if you're not familiar, Cluster API was originally built to support self-managed Kubernetes, so um, we, over time, added support in several of the providers, so Kebz has AKS support, Kappa has EKS support, and then I think we now have uh, GKE uh, in progress in Kebz, and then uh, Oracle folks are also supporting um, the managed provider there. So, uh, yeah, so that has been an example of the community coming together and us brainstorming um, and trying to align and have consistency across clouds and providers. And I think that is where the diversity really comes in and being able to you know, exchange ideas and come to a consistent experience across providers instead of each provider having its own experience and users having to learn something new every time they go to a new provider. Um, I will try to move on because I don't want to take too much time on this slide, but there's a lot of really great stuff here. Uh, COPS usage in SIG testing, that's a collaboration with SIG testing and SIG infra. Uh, so that's in progress. There's a KEP, check it out if you're interested. Uh, the Minikube graphic user interface, um, also really cool. Um, encourage you to try it. Um, there's also a Minikube talk, I think that was earlier or coming up. Um, so if you're interested, check that out. And then uh, etcd ADM no longer embeds etcd version, which is great because it means it's more lightweight and it can work with new versions of etcd. And then finally, we've been working with the LTS working group that is newly formed. Uh, so just wanna give a shout out to that. Um, we are one of the sponsoring SIGs for it. And so there's lots of great discussions happening there in terms of what should LTS look like and should LTS be a thing? All right. Okay, so I've talked a lot about what was accomplished, which is great, there's a lot, but I think now um, for you all, what's interesting is where can you help, right? So where do these projects need the most help? And some of these are just uh, call-outs that the projects themselves gave us as things that they need help with. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight a few. Um, if you're looking for a new area to contribute, um, you know, the Minikube project needs help with testing and pro. And you, we also have Kubadium, which is looking for help everywhere. So if you have uh, you know, bandwidth and would like, Kubadium is a really foundational part of all of this, so it's a really interesting uh, piece of software to understand and dive into. 
Um, so if you are looking to contribute somewhere, that's a great place to start. The cluster API and providers always need help with reviews um, and contributions. The cluster API operator would love help with documentation. So if documentation is your thing, um, maybe consider trying it out, learning about it throughout the process, and then documenting it. Um, and then uh, cluster API provider nested wants help with a nested control plane provider uh, or controller. Uh, vSphere would like help with the uh, migration to the prior cluster. So if you've done that in another project and you would like to consult and help, um, definitely reach out to those folks. And then etcd IDM would like to contribute and collaborate more with the newly formed uh, etcd SIG. All right. So in direct contrast to what we just said earlier, uh, we do have some roadmap items. Um, we have been talking for a while like, about how do we graduate more of our APIs. We, we already treat them as stable. We're already doing all the work to support them across multiple versions of Kubernetes. And the first two are Kubernetes off of V1 beta 4. Um, and there's also talks like about what's needed to bring it to stable to V1. And also cluster API, both V1 beta 2 and the V1 stable release. This will come up soon. Like, so I would just uh, encourage you to join uh, the uh, community meetings. Um, the cluster API one happens every Wednesday at 10 a.m. PT. And then a lot of other things for CAPI specifically. Um, graduating machine pools, that has been something that uh, we have had like on the roadmap for a while. That um, today is an experiment. It's not enabled by default. So we'll need help like to kind of mature it like, to the maturity level of the rest of the APIs. Um, then we also have LTS Carpenter implicit upgrade working groups. Something that we have introduced like this year or last year. Um, is working groups within cluster API. So they're kind of a little smaller than the usual Kubernetes working group. And they focus only on feature set of the cluster API. For LTS specifically, what we're looking to do is, well, I want to upgrade my control plane, but I do have these nodes that I actually want to keep on an older version of Kubernetes for a little longer. So we're working with the LTS SIG to kind of provide that feedback and also incorporate it like in our own validation um, webhook when, when you run an upgrade. Carpenter, it's the new hot thing. Uh, so we're both, I guess, Azure like just um, uh, added support for Carpenter. AWS already has it. Uh, and we're trying also to in implement support inside of Cluster API. So Cluster API already has a concept of pools of nodes. How do we auto scale those? And how do we integrate also with the cloud providers themselves? In place upgrade, it's a hot potato. Uh, so there's a good, good group of folks that are now just like thinking about it, both in terms of like what does it take for us to upgrade the operating system itself and Kubernetes, but in place, do we do a reboot? Don't we do a reboot? What does it take to get there? It's going to be a long road. So if you have experience or um, any thoughts on it, uh, please join the working group. Um, and then something that I'm very excited about is. Now that we have done very simple, you know, it's like we can create a single cluster, we can manage it, um, but what about fleets? It's really hard to run controllers against fleets. Um, and something we're collaborating with controller runtime is how do we do multi-cluster support? But then when we do multi-cluster support, like Argo CD has a concept of this, it's really hard to understand, well, Cluster API already has a registry. Can I just run a controller against the entire fleet without me configuring much of it? Can I just run in the management cluster and it will look at the whole fleet that's under management? So that's kind of what we're looking at. And there's a lot of challenges there. So again, if you want to help, please reach out and I'll be happy to listen. Um, ETA testing, we talked about it a little. And documentation improvement, this is like kind of like across the board. We just have to do better. Um, and then what's next? SIG-wide initiatives. Um, we have two main things. The first one is definitely continuing the project health assessment, which is, uh, has got really good feedback, and we keep con continuing on it. On that, um, something that we have found inconsistency across the board within our SIG is the APIs. Um, Kubernetes has like an API review um, board, uh, and which like, Probably uh, some of our projects will also submit for review eventually. Um, but we would like to do like a simpler one within our SIG. 
So to standardize our APIs, make it more consistent, and also kind of make sure that when we build new APIs, we, we kind of avoid the normal foot guns with custom resource definitions that if you have used them before, I'm sure you have had experience with them. Um, and the third is focus more on the user experience. Like, do we think that like these APIs should evolve like in a different direction over time? Um, can we make them more extensible? Um, and, and so on. I think this is you. Yeah, thank you, Vince. Okay. So this is our final call to action. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to get involved. This is uh, especially relevant if you're uh, new to Kubernetes, trying to get involved but don't know where to start. Um, so here are a few tips for getting started. So one of the things, first things I always recommend folks do is check out the contribution guide. Um, and it has a ton of useful info uh, in there. And then also look at the community page for the SIG. Um, every SIG has a landing page where you can find the current SIG chairs and tech leads. You can find all the meeting times and meeting notes uh, for office hours, which are public and recorded and posted to YouTube. Um, so highly recommend checking those out. Um, attending the office hours, uh, just come, say hi. You know, uh, we always leave space for new folks to introduce themselves and welcome them. Um, so tell us why you're here, what you're trying to get started on, and we'll try to help you as much as we can. Um, also, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, it can seem sometimes intimidating when you're joining for the first time and like everyone knows what they're talking about, but really, I think people always appreciate questions because it gives us a chance to onboard new uh, contributors, which we love. Um, look for good first issues and help wanted uh, labels on GitHub. Those are typically good uh, accessible issues that you can get started on with uh, somewhat minimal knowledge of the existing code base. Um, some of the really good examples, issues that fall into this category um, are docs and testing, um, and then anything to do with developer tooling or release automation. Um, those are the kinds of things that really help the project health and really help reduce tech debt uh, and are very much appreciated by maintainers. And they're also good because you can get started without having necessarily understood the entire system yet. Um, if your project that you're looking at has a release team, that's a great way to get involved. Cluster API has one. We're actually currently recruiting for the uh, next release team uh, for 1.7. Uh, there's a call to action on Slack. Uh, so join the Slack channel. And if you're interested, you can join as a shadow. Um, or as a release lead if you're already an experienced contributor in the project. And then finally, um, I mean, this is obvious, but I, I like to say it over and over again, um, you know, chop wood, carry water, be kind. Um, I think the best way to build, you know, uh, a reputation in the community and uh, get to know folks and is just to uh, get started. And, um, you know, we all need help. Everyone is... Uh, you know, a lot of maintainers of projects are doing this also, you know, uh, on their free time, which sometimes people don't realize, but um, it's, you know, any help is appreciated. And so, yeah, folks will be happy to help you if you're looking to contribute. So, uh, yeah, and then finally, I just want to cover also a few other sessions that are happening here at KubeCon. If you'd like to get more info, uh, I encourage checking them out. Um, all of those are related to the cluster lifecycle. Unfortunately, due to the scheduling of this talk, a lot of them have already passed. However, um, you can check out the recording. Um, all those talks are gonna be recorded and then um, you, know, uh, you can look at that later. And I also wanna highlight the last one, which is the Meet the Kubernetes Contributor Community, which used to be called SIG Meet and Greet and has been renamed. That is happening tomorrow from 12 to three in the afternoon, and that is a really great chance to get one-on-one -on -one talking time with all of the SIG uh, maintainers. I'm gonna be there. Um, there's gonna be a lot of other SIG representatives that are gonna be there, and it's a great chance to just have a chat and get to know the SIGs and what they work on. Um, so definitely consider checking that out if you're interested. All right, that gives us 10 minutes for Q&A. Thank you very much. And yeah, if you have any questions, I think there's a mic here, or you can just shout. Hello.
Hello, great overview. I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit more about if somebody wants to get involved. Oh, did that just stop? Okay. If somebody wants to get involved, um, do they already have to have a bunch of access to a bunch of test infrastructure so that they can somehow come in already super powered? Like what if they just have themselves and their GitHub and their computer and a will to help? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so I think it depends on the project. Is my mic working? Hello? Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Now it's loud. <laughs> Uh, it depends on the project. Um, if you uh, look at Cluster API, for example, we have all our testing runs with a uh, infrastructure provider called uh, CabV, which is Cluster API uh, Docker, so provider Docker. And it, what it does is it runs uh, Kubernetes in Docker, so it uh, uses containers to simulate virtual machines and that is your Kubernetes cluster, so it all runs locally on your laptop, so you don't need any cloud uh, subscription or anything like that. Um, so that's one of the very common you know, testing uh, mechanisms that we use across the SIG uh, to run things locally, and then each infrastructure provider will have its own uh, you know, testing infra for various clouds. I think Cluster API has also dev containers now, yes. uh, and can run tilt locally um, as well. So it's a nice user it developer experience, I guess. Yes, shout out to tilt. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, go for it. Um, where do you think are the best opportunities for less technical folks to get involved? Maybe for this specific SIG or SIGs in general, if we're a product manager, or maybe we're Maybe leaders are interested in contributing to the community uh, in some way. How do you uh, recommend those folks contribute to, and it could be more general, maybe not even in a specific space. Yeah, um, so I'll repeat the question for the recording. So the question was, uh, what do you recommend for folks that are less technical who want to contribute, like for example, program managers or leaders, what are some areas where they can get involved and help? Um, so I think uh, there's a lot of help needed there. Um, I mean, the thing that jumps to mind is documentation. Um, that's one where we always need help. Uh, I see people nodding. Uh, they're all like, please help us. <laughs> um, so yeah, documentation is a great one. Um, I think program management, we need a lot of that in Kubernetes in general. Um, roadmaps, <laughs> I, yeah, I talked about roadmaps earlier, but like seriously, it's one of the things where sometimes like we don't have PMs and it's just a bunch of devs working on their own thing and driving. And it's, I think, having PMs there to help also d define like the milestones and you know, uh, backlog grooming, things like that, um, could be super helpful for some of the projects, depending on their maturity. Um, so yeah, any non-technical help is always welcome. Um, you, know, you don't need to code to contribute. That's, I think, something that is very important to remember. Of course, code contributions are also very much needed, but there's a ton of stuff you can do to help, even if you're not you know, a programmer. I think you cover pretty well. Uh, one thing that I may add maybe is like, if you're a product manager or like a literary company and you have use cases that we might not have considered, just because they're not in our project purview, um, come to just speak to us. Like it could be something that like we might not have thought about or something that we have thought about and we have might already discuss that's too difficult to do today or this is not the right time. But um, we're always welcome like a new use cases, feedback and things that we can put on the roadmap eventually. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, user feedback. All right, any other questions? I'm actually surprised by the turnout. This 4.30 p.m. talk is uh... a... <laughs> All right, well, thank you everyone for coming. And, yeah, we'll be here.